The brain is a learning prediction machine. If your brain learns to be aroused by watching other people have sex, it is not necessarily going to carry over to the ability to get aroused when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else. We can actually train our brains to be more in control. And that's all thanks to some cool tips from Andrew Huberman. First things first, it's important to understand that our brains are pretty amazing. They can change and adapt over time, which is called neuroplasticity. Which means that if we've picked up some not so great habits, we can actually train our brains to do it differently. If we were to look at ourselves through the lens of an experiment like we would an animal experiment, we think that animal is sick. The higher the dopamine peak, the bigger the drop afterwards. And it's not that you drop to baseline, you drop below baseline. Pornography is a serious issue. And because of the way that it taps into these very primitive systems, it's as serious in, in my mind as some of the other drugs of abuse. Porn can hook you. But in this video, we're gonna learn how to break free. Porn is just one example of how things mess with our dopamine, making us slaves. But don't worry, because Huberman knows the secrets to escape. By following his advice, you'll regain control and no longer be trapped by these dopamine hijackers. Let's learn together and take back our power. The idea here is that, you know, I'm not saying pornography as a stimulus is bad or good. What I'm saying is it, in its availability and its extreme forms, it's a very potent stimulus and very potent stimuli of any kind, extremely palatable food, extreme pornography, um, extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping, those set a threshold for dopamine release. Again, it's not, these things aren't good or bad, they just have to be controlled in a way because when people are pursuing dopamine peaks over and over and over and they aren't getting them, typically it's because they've been pursuing that activity far too often. Chasing constant happiness can lead you into a tough cycle that's really hard to break free from. But understanding this trap can set you free and help you change your worst habits. Bear in mind, this idea is only the beginning. I mean, there, there's so much more to learn that this video can help you with. This video can keep you away from these bad habits forever. By exploring deeper, you'll find the knowledge that you need to live a happier and more balanced life. The cycling back and forth between dopamine and low dopamine states, dopamine fasting as it were, but maybe just low dopamine states, these are natural rhythms that exist in the nervous system. We have to remember what the dopaminergic system is there for. We know as a, as a generic form of motivation and pursuit, you can imagine the human or the animal that's hungry or thirsty. It needs energy to go pursue the thing. So the idea that you have to eat in order to get energy, that's true. But you need energy in order to get the thing to eat. So our nervous system has energy also. That's dopamine and epinephrine. Yes, we use glucose and glycogen, etc. when we're pursuing things. But the idea here is you're pursuing something and then either by smell or by sight, you think you're on the right track. If you look at somebody who's high on cocaine or methamphetamine, it's all about pursuit because that's a very dopaminergic drug. You look at somebody who's taken a drug, and I'm not suggesting people do this, but it really ramps up serotonin. Let's say a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, Prozac, Zoloft, etc. The side effects of those drugs, if the dosages are too high, lack of appetite, lack of libido, kind of meh about life, you know, then so they'll adjust the dose down. That's because those are serotonergic drugs. So in, in general, when we are in pursuit of things, dopamine is, is quite high. The thing about cell phones is when you first get on there and you haven't, let's say you're it, no Wi-Fi on the flight or something and you land, it can actually be quite stimulating. You get a lot of dopamine. Oh, there's this, oh, there's that. But very quickly, when you're scrolling on social media, you're no longer getting the novelty, but you're continuing to do it. And you almost don't know why you're doing it. At that point, it shifts over to something that's a bit more like an obsessive compulsive behavior, where the, we can define an obsessive compulsive behavior, where the obsession leads to a compulsion. So the obsession is a thought, the compulsion is a behavior, but the acting out of the compulsion merely serves to increase the obsession, right? This is very different than being obsessed with food or obsessed with cleanliness. There's no payoff. Right, exactly. There's no anxiety relief by carrying out the compulsion. With OCD behaviors, like scrolling social media, 
the dopamine quickly wanes and then you find that you're just sort of, and we've all been there, you're scrolling, you're like, why am I doing this? This isn't that interesting. That is, this isn't that interesting. Now, the algorithms for social media are very clever and I don't want to demonize it. I, you know, provide a lot of, a lot of my life is spent on, you know, on social media now, but in the algorithms that they've incorporated function on the, the most powerful way to keep people doing a behavior or an animal for that matter is intermittent random reward or random intermittent reward that you don't know when you're going to hit the jackpot. So you're scrolling, you're scrolling, and then you see something. So if you're reading some interesting things, this came out in the news, this came out, and then it's all of a sudden a riot or a person that is jump, is base jumping off a building. And then you, what happens is you start getting the system working for that next dopamine hit that you don't know when it's going to come. It's just like gambling. So I look at social media as initially being very dopaminergic, driving reward, surprise, and excitement, but very quickly transitioning to something more like OCD and the kinds of behaviors where it looks, if, you, if we were to look at ourselves through the lens of an experiment like we would an animal experiment, we think that animal is sick. Pornography is a serious issue. And because of the way that it taps into these very primitive systems, it's as serious in, in my mind as some of the other drugs of abuse, like the, the opioid crisis. And we talked about cell phones. You ever notice that when you get on a phone and you're scrolling Instagram, it's like a lot of fun. Like this stuff is cool. You're seeing people. And then sometimes you're on there and like, this doesn't feel good, but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. I'm just doing it. That's exactly how people talk about their drug use. That's exactly how people talk about alcohol use. That's exactly how people talk about gambling. You imagine this high, but the high doesn't show up and that's, you, you're dopamine depleted. You need to take some time away from it and then come back and then you can enjoy it again. Now, with pornography, it's a slippery slope. Porn and masturbation, these things are, really are. I'm not calling them sinful. What I'm saying is they are potentially addictive, especially with the availability of pornography. So, um, you know, beware, you know, just everyone's different and, and people have to have to be careful about these circuitries, you really need to protect them. They are they are super valuable. And so I would say, in keeping with our theme of you know, what are the other things to do to support testosterone, would be uh, don't engage, I would avoid pornography. It's amazing to think like, why do we ever stop? The, unlike weight training where I can't do a 500 pound deadlift, I just can't. I could train for it, but I certainly can't do a 600 pound deadlift, I can't do that. What causes us to stop an endurance event is usually not a physical barrier. It's almost always a purely mental barrier. So if right. you're in that moment, you're gonna need a kit of things to right. pull from. So you can think this is in honor of someone else that passed away. Right. And you will find a gas reserve that's amazing. Our ability to time reference in the past, present, or future. I do believe that we can be in the present and the past, or the present and the future, or only in the present, or only in the future, or only in the past. But I don't think that we can really think about past, present, and future all at once. And this has a similarity to uh, covert attention. Like we can split our visual attention into two things. We really can duo task, even though we can't multitask so well, or we can bring those two spotlights of attention to the same location. But it's very hard to split our attention in really well into three domains. I think that that's very, very challenging. And time, our time referencing scheme tends to be just one or two time references.